Thank you. So my name is Gerald Hetzinger. I'm from Austria. Uh, and this time, we have seen a lot of different organizations, universities, NGOs. Now it's a company. Yeah. OK. Yes. So I will tell a little bit about us. So we are a young company, an Austrian company. These are the three founders. I'm one of them. And um, we are based in Vienna. And uh, the company is quite young, but uh, there is more of five or five decades of Moodle experience in, 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 in these three heads. And now we are working a lot all over the world. Uh, what do we offer? We offer, we understand ourselves as a one-stop shop because we believe strongly you can make education technology just work if you understand all around it, didactics, content, and also, of course, circumstances, strategy. So digital platform, as we, we do conception, we do also training, and we create uh, content training. Digital platform and content development, storytelling, so Storytelling is one of our favorites when it comes to content creation, and today I will come up with a few stories as well, um, and application service. Okay, so, so we are, this is the place where our projects are, they are all over the world. I heard GSZ already, we are deeply involved with GSZ as well. Um, but you can see uh, this is not always in places where just, for instance, connectivity is really nice or where delivery of e-learning might be a little bit different than in other places. Yeah? So here I would like to start with this map. Now, this is a map. Um, uh, it shows more or less um, um, the overview of how uh, regions are connected online. Of course, there's a lot of connectivity in Europe, but uh, don't let fool you by this map. I know many places in my home country where you don't have connectivity at all. Um, but you can see there are many places which are basically not so well connected. And how can we make e-learning possible in this region? It's not just always regionally. Like we learned right now, I'm so happy that I had you as a speaker ahead of me. You have also other circumstances where you have to say, OK, I can't provide online training. But I can provide some kind to, to, through being very creative, I may be able to provide some, let's say, digital training. Yeah. OK. Um, so I would like to share a little bit our experience that we gained throughout our projects, which we uh, did in different countries all over the world. I don't want to focus too much on to say, okay, in developing countries, currently we, are make, we, are, we have a project in Germany which was explicitly asked for offline learning, okay, in Germany. So I wouldn't go that far saying, okay, it's developing countries, I think when, when it's needed, actually. And which challenges do, did we, did appear on, on, on our project? Yeah, unstable internet, of course. This is one thing which once in a while appears. Yeah? Say, OK, unstable internet doesn't mean it's not there. Maybe it's there sometimes. Maybe it's somewhere else, two kilometers to go. This is all which you have to take in consideration. Yeah? Unstable power. Yeah, what, what do you do? OK, you have an online class. Everything is set, and power goes off. What can we do? Devices, the, the device setup may be uncertain, especially when you can uh, go with strategies like bring your own device, saying, okay, students bring their own device. They are not provided by campus com uh, computer rooms or whatsoever. So, but the device setup may be uh, uncertain. We have also experienced sometimes, it's not the device which is the problem, it's the problem what's on it. Of course, for some, uh, groups, this is the only digital device they have. They have all the images on there, just for instance. They make movies, of course. Why? Because they can and they want to share. That's a very important part of it. But then it's completely full. Security. Um, this is a very tricky um, um, challenge because it came up when I was working with uh, a distance learning institution creating their own content in Portuguese. And of course, there was a lot of competition. The first question was, how can I secure my content? It's the opposite of open educational resources, basically. But I understand the concern. Um, economic limitations, of course. Internet may be cheap in comparison to what, what, what uh, an average person 
let's say in Austria can, can, can afford, but in, in other countries it's, it might be different. It's very likely a difference. So taking consideration, okay, what limitation could be there? And content development limitation. We have one client in, in Ghana, very interesting, and they started working with an online authoring tool. And they told us, hmm, Gerald, we are not able to complete our courses because our internet goes off and on. So even when it comes to consideration like, okay, how do we get the content if we want to create it, um, how can it do that? There, so these are the challenges which you came up with, especially when you have uh, uh, online training. There are many more, but these are the recent ones that we, uh, that we were confronted with, okay? But don't get me wrong, we have, just, we have also opportunities. Yeah? There's a strong demand, storytelling. I was working at this very uh, distance learning institution. When I started, it was 2008, there were 1,000 students, maybe a little bit more. By 2011, there were 8,000. So they had really an increase of student numbers tremendously. So there is a huge demand on doing that. Why, there are some reasons why this is so, but we have to take into account that the student numbers are increasing really in a different way than just doing like in Austria or somewhere else, in Europe or maybe in the US. The impact, yeah, you can create a high, this is the result from the strong demand. Of course, things are changing quicker. If you have exponential growth of, of students in your institution for the whole society. So you, you produce a lot of, of, of you, you bring a lot of people to a different level. So this is a huge opportunity. Yeah, global delivery, of course. So I can create a course, let's say, in Canada, and I can deliver it in Austria. Of course, we were talking about translation. I'm, I'm, I was really happy to, that Moodle included translation because we had to program our own translation tool, connected this with DeepL or Google Translate, and it took us a while to work with that. But this is, I'm really happy that this is now really included in the Moodle or can be downloaded as a public uh, uh, um, a plugin. We're really happy about that. And of course, as a result of all these opportunities, it will empower people to be self-sufficient, to make their own decisions on, on, and based on knowledge. And this is a huge opportunity that we have and that uh, digital learning can do its contribution. So, ha having these opportunities and challenges, um, we are looking on, on different aspects of digital learning. I don't want to focus too much on the technology because I know it's Moodle Mood. It's most likely very much to technology because Moodle is the, the street that many uh, um, um, online services are driving. But we have to look on the learners. Yeah? It's not just saying, okay, yeah, uh, we're doing a project somewhere, let's say, in Mozambique. This is because I know Mozambique, so I'm taking this one. You can't say, okay, um, in Mozambique, people are like that. It's never happening. All over the world, we have to focus more on the target group. Because if you say, okay, you do something for university staff who has good access in the university, it will be different than a grassroots project where you say, okay, I don't know even if the people are able to access. So it's very important we look on the learners very in detail before we start working with a digital learning program. Yeah? Uh, Technology, of course. Yeah. Um, here we come, okay, how do they access? Do they have a cell phone? Do they have all computers? Do we have to mix it? Is it bringing on device? Um, I think this is very important to, to look at because you can create the nicest course environment, but if people cannot access it, it has no impact. Didactics, uh, we would consider didactics as the core. Yeah, because didactics will guide everything what you see here. Yeah. Um, it means also, okay, how, to, how to, can you scaffold your activities in order that they make, of course, a nice learning path and have the impact you want actually from a, from a learning perspective. But of course, if you have um, a didactics which doesn't allow you to deliver, then it won't make sense. Yeah, content development, of course, I was mentioning already before, it's very important that the content development process is in a way that you can produce the content. Don't use too complex tools, or maybe uh, it, if you use a lot of videos and you want to deploy on a, on, in a region which, where internet is really weak, then you might get in trouble. Yeah, the delivery of learning itself, of course, okay, uh, there's the process of saying, okay, 
now I have it on the platform, so how does it get to the, to the students, to the learner? How does it get there? Especially when you have weak internet or no internet. So you have a, to establish a certain communication. And sustainability, of course, very important there. That's the reason why we like Moodle a lot, because uh, it is in terms of projects in the developing world, uh, when the projects are over, most likely you have the problem that maybe funding is over, and if you have to pay license fee, then you, the product, project is over on the day the license fee is over. And a Moodle has a, a good sustainability in terms of, because it's open source, there's a large community which is developing Moodle further, and can be reused, and uh, yeah, it's really, an, and it's really a nice community, a strong community. So, I want to talk right now a little bit deeper in, in one or two aspects which we found out that they are really important. Just for instance, we were talk, I was talking about didactics. I'm still not talking about the Moodle app, I will come to this. And I heard already the Moodle box which is here. Um, but if, when you start, when you say, okay, I'm working in an environment where, where the internet is not that good, would you use, I don't know, Netflix quality videos? I don't know. Maybe not. I wouldn't. Um, so you have to take care of, okay, what, what, what media you're using, but also if you want to use the media, how can I make them as little as possible, as small as possible? Uh, of course, resources for production. A production of some text will be easier than the production of a high-end video or maybe uh, uh, illustrations. If you have the resources to do so, very well, then you should go for it. But most likely, if you, especially when you produce for a large course environment, then it will be difficult to, to secure these resource, resources. And preferable devices, of course, this goes back to the technology and device question. If you have um, a, 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 a target group, which mostly is on the phone, you shouldn't most likely provide content which is made for desktop or maybe even TV because it will be a little bit tiny, not readable, people won't use it, learning won't happen. Okay. So I would like to show you right now one example on how we can work just for instance with videos. These are two videos which I will show you. Dieser Handlungsleitfaden soll Ihnen dabei helfen, Ihre Situation besser überblicken zu können, um für die nächsten Schritte handlungsfähig zu bleiben. Wenn nach einem So, okay. I compressed both videos. Which one is, has the high compression? This one or this one? Please. This one. This one. This one, this one. <laughs> Raise your hands. Who says this one? The others? This one? Okay. This is with the high compression, but um, imagine um, this one has three megabyte and this one has 600K. So it's, it's, it's a ratio of one to five. Yeah. And I would like to talk about videos a lot because I really like it. And uh, it's, I think it's especially when it comes to devices, it plays everywhere. Um, and when, you, when we created videos, we used, especially when it comes to uh, regions where the, where the internet is not so good, PowerPoint videos, they can be compressed really nicely. And I will show you an example later on. Because then, just for instance, we had a PowerPoint presentation which took six megabytes and we made a spoken video out of it, it was three megabytes. So it was smaller than the actual PowerPoint presentation. But there are some methodologies where, I, where you can actually save a lot of bandwidth and still provide high quality content as we want. Yeah. So there are a lot of possibilities on, on where you can actually adjust and make even high quality learning uh, available even offline. Yeah, of course, Moodle comes with a lot of activities. I won't go too deep into the activity section, uh, but you can analyze it through uh, uh, each activity. Is it even possible to run on my setting? Yeah? Very often offline setting, or maybe half offline setting, where you say, okay, people can go somewhere, download stuff, maybe exchange something, and go back to where they are and where there's no internet. So where is Moodle coming in then? Maybe, I don't know how long you guys are around with Moodle, but I remember still using Moodle on a USB stick. <laughs> it's a long time ago, but um, I don't know where to put it here. So that's maybe not the most efficient way at the moment. Yeah, Moodle app, we heard already about it. I will go deeper into that in a second. 
And this box, I think someone mentioned the Moodle, uh, the Moodle in the box. Yeah, uh, this is the 3D print, we, pr we developed it. And this is the 3D print of it, so it comes with a router, it comes with a battery, and yeah, it's Moodle installed. You can actually run it wherever you want to. Yeah? You can just access it. Uh, a large number of, of students can access it, say, okay, I want to download the material, and they can go wherever they want. Yeah. Okay? So this is just a few possibilities. There are a lot more. Be creative when you do uh, uh, online learning, but uh, this is what we actually came up with. So now I want to go a little bit more into the storytelling. This is the eFocus project. I, we presented it also on an, a prior uh, uh, e-learning conference, e-learning Africa. Maybe some of you were there. Um, this is a Moodle app. This is, the, this is a, 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 a training for medical staff in Malawi, especially. Yeah? It was a, a collaboration between uh, the, the German university, the University of uh, Hamburg-Eppenheim, and the Blantyre College of Medicine. And it's about epochus. These are these tiny um, ultrasound machinery where you can even, I think, connect to your phone and can get an analysis really quickly. And in Malawi, the, are presenter, but sometimes training is missing. Yeah? So um, the question was, first question was, okay, how do we access that? Yeah, and luckily the, the, the project manager had a good knowledge on, 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 they were training them for years, so they know the situation on site really well. And we made one survey as well amongst the target group, say, okay, how do you access yeah, and, and, and it, was very, it became very clear, okay, almost everybody of the medical staff has a cell phone. And so that was the decision, okay, go, let's go with the Moodle app because uh, it's the most feasible way and, and the most flexible way of, 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 of uh, providing the training. And we were really happy that uh, by the time when we started the project H5P, packages were already offline possible, which is a huge difference because we wanted to go with H5P for the reasons I mentioned before, having the possibility uh, of doing it offline, it's possible right now already, and having H5P also directly integrated into Moodle. So, um, what we did here, maybe from a technical perspective, we created an own course format. Yeah? This, might, this might be interesting for you. We created an own course format, which is accordion style. Yeah? I think this is in Moodle 4.0. We really like the upgrade to Moodle 4.0 because then it came natively, so more or less. But we created an accordion format with some information, like you see on top. Uh, uh, there is one activity in there, zero of them I did already, and the other ones with, with has a, which have a tick, they are already done. And the, this is really nice because there it's possible to create a large course even in the app without losing somehow, somehow the overview, okay, what's in there. Basically, these are sections. Yeah. Um, we have also color keyed it, meaning, okay, the, this is the blue course, we have a red course, a green course. This makes it very easy to identify which course I want actually see. Because you need everything, especially on the app, from a UX perspective, you need every aspect you can use in order to make uh, uh, the, the to, to generate an overview. And this is the second thing we did. Yeah. So we created a course format, we created uh, the, the color key, and we created uh, also an assessment and an, an assessment uh, uh, format because the one which is natively with Moodle is just one online field and maybe you can upload something, but there were many criteria, okay, on how they want to assess that. And the cool thing is, it's all possible offline. It's all possible offline. In there, you find um, videos with H5P interactively, and um, you can actually work with these and the size of the course in total is maybe 120 megabyte. It's not too big. So it is downloadable wherever people are. And you can uh, download it in chunks or you can download it all at once. But everyone who knows the Moodle app knows how it works. But I have to be really, I have to say the upgrade to Moodle 4.0 of the app was really a huge step forward for us. Okay, um, something else. The cool thing is we have not changed the Moodle app. It looks very, it looks, uh, um, it's customized, but we didn't change the Moodle app itself. Download the standard app, you load it, 
and then the color key uh, will be uh, laid over and the course format is losing as well, which means you can always use the newest Moodle app, it doesn't matter. So it's a very specific course format for the Moodle app we developed. Okay, yeah, maybe some other projects. I don't know how much time do we have. Half, 10, okay. Um, we are still in the, somehow in the region. This was Malawi, here we are in Rwanda. There we have uh, provided a regular Moodle platform uh, for a project for school uh, head teacher, school head teacher training with an organization called VVOB, it's from Belgium. Um, and this was a very interesting project because they came up to us, okay, we need a Moodle platform now. <laughs> okay, we said, no, no problem, you get one. And um, for how many people? Yeah, maybe 500, that's okay. And by accident, half a year later, we thought this server is really slow. And then we found out that we have had almost 1,000 concurrent users on it. And this was interesting, we said, okay, how did that come? Um, here on the back, I see our Moodle expert, Gerhard, he found out that it was not because so many users, it was just one faulty SQL queue, uh, which we had to repair and now it's working. Yeah, it's actually, uh, Moodle, 1,000 concurrent users is no problem at all. Of course, you don't have to, maybe here, it's not possible, but on a regular server, it should be possible. But it was really interesting. So how did that come? Because we knew the project is not using the Moodle app, and it's not, they're not using any, uh, let's say, um, um, any other means and saying, okay, how can it, how can I uh, access that quantity? Um, there, um, there was, um, there was one project before that they were handed out laptops. Uh, so there was a, a quite a huge quantity of laptops around. It's also a different strategy. Of course, makes your life easier because you can assure, okay, everyone enters with a very similar device. So you, you optimize everything to your device and then you can make sure people are, are accessing. Yeah? Um, but still, they, they reported challenges with access. Could be a problem with Moodle as well, because of course with long delay times of accessing and responding, maybe some processes can lag, and so uh, this is also maybe some causes some server load, but this one was okay. Uh, we upgraded also the server. Right now, they have no problem in using it, thousands of users at the same time. Um, but this one was with regular uh, courses. And still, we have other projects as well where we use a regular course, actually, a, a, a environment, not the offline, like the KPTC. This is a training center in, 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 in Ghana. And there we're using Moodle just for administrative parts. We don't do too much learning. They don't do too much learning on it, but they organize the whole training institution on use, with using Moodle and do a, a lot of evaluations and they have a highly standardized uh, course design so that they actually are able to uh, uh, um, um, even cross-check evaluations. What we did just, for instance, created a facilities database because they get evaluated with a highly uh, standardized evaluation and we use uh, reporting in order to find out, okay, uh, how many courses did some facilitators, or, uh, the facilitators already hold, how was their rating, maybe they can even upload their interests and also their CV. So this is actually a very interesting output. But it's not always offline that they need it because we made there, there was also an assessment and for this case, there, it was not necessary, yeah? Okay. Yeah, here the box, I brought it with me. A 3D printed box, standalone, especially we developed it um, based on our experiences that we had that sometimes you have power cuts and no internet and no chance to get internet. The regions, just for instance, north of Malawi, there it can happen that you really end up somewhere where there's no internet. Or maybe in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a correctional institution, institution, you can put it there, you're not in the internet. People can go with their phone or whatever they have and can access it, there's the router, and then they have access on the computer. And there's no internet involved. That could be interesting. Um, other cool thing is, it's 3D printed. If we print it here or print it somewhere else, doesn't matter can be actually someone else, whoever wants it, can actually print it out. Uh, we did the design, we can make it public, so, so if you want to print it out, it's a possibility. In, in the meanwhile, we have a Raspberry 4 in there, eight, megabyte, uh, eight gigabyte RAM, it's actually very performant. Um, shouldn't be a problem to have 
a nice classroom solution for that, or even more. Okay, um, yeah, I think I am more or less through with my presentation. Just a slight overview of, I know many things have to go way deeper in order to find out how things, how, how you can analyze things for yourself, but it's a very individual process, but we are really happy with some of our solutions, and I hope, um, I'm really happy if, um, if you, can, you can approach us, and I'm really happy to answer your questions if you have some. Thank you. Thank you. Again, really, really interesting. We do have time just for a couple of questions before we break. So, uh, Francis is with the microphone. Yeah, okay, one question already. Thank you so much. My name is Victoria from World Education. I am very curious about the 3D printed box. So, have you worked with fabrication labs in Africa to have those printed or like, what, what's the vision for that? Like, I'm just curious. Um, the vision would be the very same scenario that you mentioned. To print it, to print it where it actually it is used, because there are two components. The one is, of course, um, creating capacity in doing things so, but I'm very sure there are, you will find many people all over, the, all over the world who can do 3D printing. And second, of course, that the maintenance is there where it's used as well. So if it breaks something, it can be reprinted. But you need somebody who is doing that. That's the reason why we actually, we, this one we printed here, of course, because I, I brought it here. But the idea is to have everything on the place where it's actually used. Because if it breaks, somebody should be there who is actually in, in this situation and has the knowledge very specific knowledge what this one needs. And have you, just a quick follow-up question, have you worked with any like, has it been printed locally or no. not yet? That, this but one, that's the plan. Uh, I would redesign it a little bit, to be honest, because we found already a few flaws on it. It works, yeah, but I would redesign it a little bit to have really a good design, not just the form and shape, also more elegant, but also we have some cooling issues, we found out, especially, in, I think, in the region in Sub-Saharan Africa, cooling is a very important issue, and this one is not enough, this we found out. And in the future, maybe some other, other, other more topics, because the other one, it's, it's like we have, this is called, you can extend the recipe, and there is one extension in it, but we would like to have a few more. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Kais. Uh, quick question, well, actually two. The first one is, do you have an estimation of uh, roughly how much it would cost to get a box like that? Uh, in terms of you know the components and the printing, and uh, second question is about the SQL query you mentioned earlier. Is that something you found in core and has it been fixed, or is it the uh, a query in a third-party plugin? And would you care to share which query is that? Thank you. Um, yes, I start with the second question. Yes, of course we are eager to share. I don't know, Gerhard, if we sh if you have shared it already. I think we even found it on the Moodle forum that this is a problem. But we can reshare it, of course, to say, okay, if you have high numbers. I don't know, maybe it's solved in Moodle 4.0 because we used 3.8 by that time. Um, but of course, we'll share it. And this one, yes, um, phew, difficult to say. Yeah, you buy the recipe, all the components, these are standard components. We bought it themselves, we didn't build them. And the print, of course, depends very much on the material you use. Um, I don't know, in Austria, this one costs around 200 euros to print, but it's a single box. I think if you print 20, it will be cheaper. If you use a, a, a cheaper filament, maybe it's cheaper, um, but the, the 3D design is there and it can be used. Okay. okay one last question, just one last question, thank you. Uh, my question is very specific about making content that is compressed and will download to be used offline. We were hoping H5P was the answer when everything was available offline. Mm -hmm. But when I do my tests, I find that it's pre-loading nearly every library within the H5P package. So even the simplest H5P interaction is becoming huge with bloatware. Yeah. We've tried Lumi 5 to strip out anything excess, but we still are finding really long download times without any indication that something's 
happening. So sadly, we've stepped away from H5P. So do you have any insights into which H5P packages are really working and did you find <laughs> any other workarounds? We are mostly using the interactive video and the quizzes normally we do with Moodle, not just because it's slim, it's also when it comes to reporting and detailed uh, feedback and uh, course completion. Um, we prefer using the Moodle because Moodle, what Moodle really does well is questions and, and, mm. and, 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 and this is what, what our experience. But um, I, maybe we can talk about it later because this is a new experience because we have actually, when, when I go back to the, uh, the e project which I showed, that yeah, we have no problems with sizes. This works pretty well. 